Okay, we are live, and I'm just going to uh, wait for that to kick in. Let's hope that the sound is working. So, uh, yeah, finished the 1410 class, uh, left to go read my kid a book, came back, Windows tablet was kind of dead. Um, rebooted, reconnected my webcam. Oh, my webcam is not interesting. Um, you're getting my audio. You are not getting my webcam. Let's see if I can fix this. Yeah, that's the right webcam. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to go without webcam today. That's all right. As long as you can hear me. Wait and see how that's going to look. Okay, so there's just a seized webcam image. Um, uh, technical fun. Um, why don't I remove that? There we go. Take that away. Um, just going to try restarting. Uh, video capture device. Okay. See there, that's better. Now, let me move myself down to the corner. Figure out which mouse is my real mouse. There. Okay. Alright, so, um, yeah, there was just kind of a leftover image on that webcam, but I was, uh, it was not actually, um, recording. Seems like it's working now. Ah, <sighs> good. Let's go. Get this done. Put this thing into tablet mode. And away we go. So let's, uh, jump into the war room. So we're going to do, uh, Sort of two topics today. We're going to talk about how to describe surfaces in three dimensions, and then we're going to get into uh, functions of several variables. Um, before we get that, uh, oh my god, that was supposed to be two paragraphs. I don't know why there isn't a gap between them. Um, two warm up problems, area problems left over from polar coordinates. Um, I think we were going to do this last time, and we ran out of time, so we didn't get her done. Um, so the first question, I don't know why this collapsed like that. Um, first one, um, R is one plus two cos theta. I feel like we needed a couple more area examples. Um, so this is uh, one of these limassons. Looks something like this. Um, not like that. Through, around, around, like so. Okay, that's the curve that we're looking for. Um, so the first one wants the area that is uh, inside the outer loop but outside the inner loop. So we want kind of that area. Did we do this one last time? I feel like we might have done this one last time. Um, so just to remind you how this goes, uh, we will kind of go through the details. You need to find where are those, where are the two points where that inner loop begins and ends. Um, yeah, this was supposed to be enumerated. Oh well. So, when is r equal to zero? Right, we want to find out when that curve passes to the origin. Well, we would need cos theta to be minus one half. That means that theta is either two pi over three or four pi over three. Okay, so that's here, there's 2 pi over 3, and there's the, the 4 pi over 3. Okay, so basically what we would do is we want to kind of think of the area as coming in, in two pieces. There's this area here, okay, 
and so we'll call that one and then there's going to be this area here we'll call that area two okay so if we do area one we'd be looking at so it's one half integral from zero to two pi over three it's always r squared d theta for area so it's one plus two cos theta all squared d theta okay and the second area is the same thing but we would go from 2 pi over 3 so 2 pi over 3 is when we enter that inner loop and we exit at 4 pi over 3 but it's the same function in this case okay so we do something like that uh, there's other ways you could set this up of course we could do if we did the top half of the inner loop then we would want to go from 4 pi over 3 um, to pi I believe we're actually sorry from pi to 4 pi over 3 yeah um, from pi to 4 pi over 3 would do that bit there okay um, there's more than one way to set this up and you can play around and check that you get the same answer either way um, so the total area in this case um, the area would be twice the first area minus twice the second um, I'm not going to do the whole calculation I mean once you get it to this point you can put it in the computer right um, now you're doing you're doing problems from home once you get the integral set up if you have to ask the computer for help on, on evaluating the integral I guess that's not a terrible thing to do um, if you are doing it by hand do be careful that when you when you do this 1 plus 2 cos theta all squared okay you're gonna get 1 plus 4 sorry that's a terrible 4 4 cos theta and then you get 4 cos squared theta uh, several several people that had trouble on the online homework um, for polar curves uh, and parametric curves where they ran into trouble was forgetting that for this cos squared, right? Anytime you have even powers of sine or cosine, you've got to use power reduction formulas for that. So this becomes 1 plus 4 cos theta, uh, and then, right, so cos squared is 1 plus cos 2 theta over 2. 4 over 2 leaves you with a 2, right? So you get um, 3 plus 4 cos theta plus 2 cos 2 theta um, so be careful that you're you're expanding that correctly when you're doing these area calculations um, and then you should be you should be okay right all right um, so I do want to mention a couple other things here before we before we jump into functions of several variables uh, maybe not too many things because I I don't want to spend forever on this. I want to make sure that we get on and we have time to talk about functions of several variables. Um, but uh, we didn't have time to talk about arc length last time. So I do want to mention a, a f just a few quick words on arc length before we, before we move on. Okay. So what can we say about arc length? Well, remember we did this already even when we were doing arc length um, back in chapter 7 we said well you know we have kind of this this ds squared is dx squared plus dy squared sort of identity and and you know maybe this is there are some mathematical issues with writing something like that what does it mean to square a differential um, but we made this work right depending on whether we're writing y is a function of x or x is a function of y we, we made this work right um, and so if um, if x is is some function of t right if x is say f of t and y is equal to uh, say g of t well then uh, dx becomes f prime of, of t dt and dy becomes g prime of t dt 
Okay, and, and so what you get is you get ds is equal to, it's going to look like this, it's going to look like f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared, right? Each one comes with that sort of dt squared, and then you can factor it out. Okay, so you get that. Now that's, of course, for parametric. Okay, now what if you're doing a polar curve? Well, uh, for polar, right, if r is equal to f of theta, well then x is f of theta cos theta, y is f of theta sine theta, okay? And so then when you calculate dx, You get uh, you get f prime of theta cos theta minus f of theta sine theta, right? Product rule dy. You get f prime of theta sine theta um, plus f of theta cos theta. Again, product rule derivative. So it turns out that if you if you kind of do dx squared plus dy squared here, um, when you square these things, right, you're going to get like f prime squared cos squared, and then you're going to get f prime, right? So f prime squared cos squared from here, f prime squared sine squared from there. Um, well, sine squared plus cos squared is one, right? So you actually get an f prime of theta squared, okay? And then similarly, when you do the um, squares for the last terms, you get f of theta squared. All squared. Um, and the cross terms, the cross terms actually cancel out. Uh, everything, all, all, so the sines and cosines, everything, they actually all simplify, they all cancel. Um, and so you get something that looks like that, right? That's your, that's your ds in polar form. So if we wanted the length of that, um, for that inner loop, right, for r is one uh, plus two cos theta, right? Um, so that's my r, that's my f of theta. So dr d theta would just be minus two sine theta. So that's f prime of theta. Okay, so f of theta squared plus f prime of theta squared, I would get, well, I just, I did f of theta squared on the, on the previous slide, right? Um, right, because that's f of theta right there. So there I get three plus four cos theta plus, well, you know, actually, let me leave the four cos theta in place, right? It's one plus four cos theta plus four cos squared. Um, we have one plus four cos, oops, four cos theta, plus four cos squared theta. And then we add in the f prime squared, which is gonna be four sine squared theta. And of course, sine squared plus cos squared is one, so we get five plus four cos theta. Um, and so I can do this. I can tell you what the length of the curve is. The length of the curve is going to be the integral from where the curve begins, which is 2 pi over 3, to where the curve ends, which is 4 pi over 3, of 5 plus 4 cos theta d theta. Okay? That's the formula for the length. There's only one problem. That's not an integral that I actually know how to evaluate. So we would have to uh, we would have to use sort of numerical methods to to evaluate that thing. That's the best we can do. Um, okay, uh, I just realized I have a correction to make. Um, this this limit is wrong. If I'm just doing the the bottom half, um, this point here corresponds to theta is equal to pi. Uh, I put the limits that actually do the entire loop. So I should have done here 
I should have done. I need to go from 2 pi over 3 to pi. All right. I noticed there was nobody complaining in the comments that I got that wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, there was one more there. Um, find the area. You know what? Let me do this one. Let me do one more. Okay. I think we need a little bit more practice with polar stuff. So I'm going to give you one more as much as I really want to move on to functions of several variables. Let me do this one. So we had, there were two circles. R is equal to 4 sine theta and R is equal to 4 cosine theta. Now, uh, that may not actually look like a circle to you, but it is a circle. Let me show you why it's a circle. You've probably seen these examples already, right? Um, if I multiply both sides of this equation by r, I get r squared is 4r sine theta. So an r squared number is x squared plus y squared, and r sine theta is y. Okay? Now if I bring that 4y over and I complete the square, I can rewrite it like that. Um, similarly, this equation here is x minus 2 squared plus y squared is equal to 4, if you convert to rectangular and then complete the square. Um, and it's also probably useful to point out what are the, what are the theta ranges. Let me graph this first. Okay, so here is This is r is 4 cos theta. So that center is at 2, 0. The radius is 2, so that point there is 4, 0. Okay? Um, and notice that that circle is sitting in quadrants 4 and 1. The right range of values for theta here is to say that theta is between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now the other circle is here. Okay. Center at 0, 2. Radius is 2, so up there is 0, 4. Okay. So that's R is 4 sine theta. And that circle is in the first and second quadrants, so theta here goes between 0 and pi. Okay? All right. Now, uh, the question was asking, what is the area that's inside the blue circle but outside the red circle? So the area that I'm trying to find is this area. Okay? That's the area that I want. So one of the things that I need to get that is I need to know what's that point of intersection right there. Uh, now there's enough symmetry that you can probably guess that that corresponds to theta is equal to pi over 4. If that's not obvious, you say, well, okay, if that's a point of intersection, I should be able to just set the two r values equal to 0. So I set for sine theta equal to 4 cos theta, and I say, okay, so when is sine theta equal to cos theta? Pi over 4, right? Um, so you get that point of intersection. So now what we do is we actually have to, we do two things. Um, we're going to do this area right here. I'm going to calculate that area. Because I know what the area underneath is, right? Um, the area underneath this part is just, well, it's half a circle. So it's 1 half times pi times the radius squared, which is 2, right? So this area is just 2 pi. i got to figure out how much I want to add on. Okay? So what you have to do is you basically have to kind of think about 
these pieces here. Okay. And and the right way to think about this is that from from zero up to pi over four, you think about drawing lines out from the origin. Like that, right? Um, well, what you want to do is you want so the the region that we want. Oops. The region we want. is going to be the one where theta is between 0 and pi over 4 and r well we want to be outside the red circle so r has to be bigger than 4 sine theta but we want to be inside the blue circle so it has to be less than 4 cos theta okay and so essentially what we're doing here is we're going to calculate the area of let me shade this bit in here okay shade that in green so basically what we want to do is we want to calculate the area that's inside the blue circle and then subtract off the bit that's inside the red circle um, so what the area ends up looking like is it looks like this it's going to be one half the integral from zero to pi over four of r squared, and now I'm doing the, the outer circle, so it's 4 cos theta squared d theta, so that's inside r equals 4 cos theta, and then I have to subtract off the area that is inside the red circle, right? I don't want to include that. So I subtract off the area Oops. Sorry, that d theta was terrible. d theta. I subtract off that area. Okay. Um, now, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to actually sort that out. Um, actually, you know what? Let me, let me point something out. It's not so bad if we combine it. Um, 4 squared is 16, there's a half. Actually, I have 8 integral from 0 to pi over 4 cos squared theta minus sine squared theta d theta. You might recall that this is just cos 2 theta. Um, so we get, oh, here, look, I'm going to do it. Uh, it's going to be 4 sine 2 theta from 0 to pi over 4 um, and that's actually um, 4 it's an area of 4 odd so it's actually the whole number area uh, area is 4 uh, and then we'd add on that 2 pi for the bit underneath all right so 4 plus 2 pi gives me that that area um, okay that's my last polar example we're gonna move on I'm gonna pause for just one second here um, so I can have a sip of water and so you can ask me questions if you have any questions. Um, uh, 21 tuned in. That's good. I've got just as many from my class of 48 calc students as I had from my class of 170 linear algebra students a couple hours ago. All right. Looks like we're doing okay. I'm not seeing questions. Um, so I guess the, the, the only thing I'll leave you with for polar area um, these questions are super hard if you don't at least draw the picture. You got to draw the picture. If you don't draw the picture, you're in a lot of trouble. Okay, let's move on. Cartesian coordinates in three dimensions. Now, most of the people in this class have already done 1410 or you're in it right now, but I know not everyone is in that boat. There's at least a few people. Um, oh, I do have a question. Haha. <laughs> Let me go back. Okay. How does it calculate the white area above the line of symmetry? Um, oh, so where? So you mean? I think you mean this this area in here, right? I think possibly that area. So we're actually not including that area, if that's the question. Um, we're leaving that out because we wanted the the area which is inside the blue circle 
but outside the red circle. So anything that's inside the uh, the red circle, we're trying to remove. And we basically what we do is, is we calculate the area that's inside the blue circle up to pi over four, right? Because anything else, you know, the rest of the stuff that's inside the blue circle is already inside the, the red circle. Um, so we're actually not even bothering to calculate it because this this area here, right? Um, so this area, this bit here, that's inside the red circle. So we would have to subtract it off. Um, so we could, another way we could do it is we could calculate the the area of the entire blue circle, four pi, um, and then we could subtract off kind of this this region here. Just subtract that bit off. That's another way that you could do it, um, and that would work too. But what we did is we just kind of said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go around the blue circle. But when we get to this intersection point here, once we hit that point, well, everything past that point is inside the red circle. Um, so there's no point in calculating that area because we have to subtract it off anyway. Um, so yeah, so we just calculate the area that we need. There's certainly more, uh, more than one way to set up this problem. Um, you kind of take your pick. Okay, all right, looks like we're good. Okay, so let's move on. So 3D coordinates. So basically we take, you know, the usual, you know, we know what 2D looks like, right? So R2, we have the usual picture, X, Y. Um, we locate a point with coordinates uh, X comma Y, and, and we know what that means, right? So X is kind of the distance from that point to the Y axis. Y is the distance from that point to the X axis. Those two coordinates give us every point in the plane. Um, now what we want to do is we want to move to three dimensions. So we want to add a third direction, okay? Um, and so the way we typically draw it is we draw something that looks like this, okay? And we're going to label these, and this is sort of a standard labeling. It's not the only one. X, Y, Z. We'll do it like that. Um, other people will will choose to do like uh, this is X, this is Y, and this is Z. They like to have Z coming out of the screen, and then X and Y are kind of how X and Y were uh, before. That works too. Uh, the and of course the axes extend, right? I mean X. This is the positive X axis, and the negative X axis is over here, and here's the negative Y axis, and here's the negative Z axis. Um, right. Um, we we kind of usually draw it like this because it's it's meant to resemble like what you do if you look up you know find a corner of the room that you're in and you look for where the two walls meet the ceiling, um, and you see exactly this sort of picture right or where the two walls meet the floor you see this kind of picture, um, so that's that's the kind of visualization that we have, and and now what you do is you want to locate a point in space so you have a point and now we're going to give three coordinates right x, y and Z. And so the X coordinate now, what the X coordinate actually is, is it's the distance from that point. Well, no, that's not quite right. So the Z coordinate goes down to the X, Y plane. So here, here would be a point, say, X, Y, zero, right? Um, and then I could also kind of go this way. That would be the point zero y zero I could go over this way this would give me a point x zero zero um, and I could also what we do here is we sort of complete a box okay so I'm gonna try and draw this in so again, it's sort of rectangular coordinates, and this is now we have this rectangular box, right? And this point over here, that would be zero, zero, z. Um, so that's our that's our three-dimensional coordinate system, right? Um, I I strongly discourage you uh, from trying to actually draw 
points in space accurately because it's 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 a losing battle. Um, you can you can give it a try, but it's always it's always a mess. Uh, so you kind of give these sorts of pictures to illustrate what's going on, um, but like if you if if you've done fourteen ten and you've done lines and planes, uh, you've probably seen what happens if you try to actually plot a line in space according to uh, the values that you're given. It always comes out terrible. Um, so we tend to draw, try and come up with schematic diagrams that don't necessarily correspond exactly to the values we're dealing with. Um, sometimes we'll try to draw accurately. But this is essentially the, the coordinate system, right? Uh, so you want to think about if you, if you started at the origin, you can think about it in any number of ways, right? You can think about, okay, x tells you how far to go out along the x-axis, and once you get to x0, 0, well then y tells you how far to move parallel to the y-axis, and then z tells you how far up you need to go before you get to that point, right? Um, that's how this works. Uh, so we have three coordinate axes, right? We have an x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. Um, we can also talk, we can talk about coordinate planes. Coordinate planes come in handy. So the coordinate planes. Um, so we have the, the x-y plane. That's the set of all points where z is equal to zero. We have the y-z plane. That's all the points where, where x is equal to zero, and we have the xz plane, and that's all the points where where y is equal to zero, right? So the xy plane is, is kind of this region here, right? The yz plane is here, and the xz plane is, um, is kind of this, uh, this one here, like so, okay? Um, so those sort of three walls in your room, those are the coordinate planes, okay? So you'll often see, see references to those coordinate planes. Um, that's the starting point for Cartesian coordinates. Uh, one thing I'll also mention, distance formula. So if you want the distance between, say, x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. It's sort of the natural extension of the distance formula in the plane. x1 minus x2 squared, y1 minus y2 squared, z1 minus z2 squared, all under the square root. Okay. Um, one of the ways to see that that, uh, that that distance formula makes sense, so if we are doing, say, say one of the points is the origin, right? And we're going from the origin out to the point x, y, z. Um, well, I can draw this right angled triangle here. It doesn't look like a right angled triangle because we have to use perspective drawing in three dimensions, but that's a right angle, okay? That side of the right angle triangle is Z. Um, this side, maybe we call it R, right? Um, well, R squared is X squared plus Y squared, right? Distance in the plane from the origin to the point X, Y, zero, right? Um, and then the hypotenuse of, of this triangle here, right? The hypotenuse squared would be R squared plus Z squared. So you get x squared plus y squared plus z squared, right? That's kind of how you can come up with that formula, okay? So, we want to start describing objects in this coordinate system, right? We want to do a little bit with lines and planes, but we want to move on to surfaces more generally, okay? So, oh, did I skip to lines and planes? There we go. So. Lines you can define using parametric equations. Okay, um, those of you who have who have done linear algebra already, um, you know that you can collapse this into a single vector equation. You might write it like this: x, y, z is x naught, y naught, 
z0 plus t times a b c. Sorry, that didn't quite fit. Let me move that. Okay, we can describe a line like that. Um, and what that actually looks like in your coordinate system is you have some point. So here's your point, say x naught, y naught, z naught. And then at that point, you have some vector giving you a direction, a, b, c, right? Um, and so the the line is all of the points that you get starting at the point x naught y naught z naught and moving back and forth in the direction of that vector, right? So as you move in that direction, you generate all the points on the line. Okay. So that's um, that's how you can describe lines in three dimensions. Uh, we won't really talk much about lines. Uh, Lines are kind of the starting point, sort of the prototypical example for looking at vector-valued functions, right? We can think of we can think of this whole thing here as some like vector r that depends on this parameter t. Calculus three spends time going over vector-valued functions, and this is kind of the well, you start with the linear ones, and then you move on to more complicated things, right? Um, that's something that you can do. Uh, we will look more at planes, okay? So we can write a plane in kind of two different ways. We can write, there's kind of this more, I don't know, democratic kind of equation here where the three variables x, y, z are all treated equally. Um, but sometimes you'll also find planes written as, you know, you solve for z, so you might have some, you know, some initial point plus, um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't use a and b, I'll use big A plus ax plus by, something like that. Um, and and these actually are, are now the starting points for thinking about, like, graphs, writing z as a function of x and y. Or this is an example of what's called a level surface, where you have some function of three variables that you set equal to a constant. Um, so we'll, we'll look at generalizing both of these. Uh, for, for the little bit we do, because we're just scratching the surface in this course, right? Most of this properly belongs in, in Calc 3. Um, or calc 4, depending on how your calculus is sequenced. Um, we'll mostly look at graphs. Uh, level surfaces is something that properly belongs in, in your next calculus course, but we'll, it might come up from time to time. Um, so what happens with a plane is it turns out you can, you can make sense of this as well, um, kind of in terms of vectors. and there's an important vector that comes out for any plane. And this is the so-called normal vector. So a plane ends up looking like this. It's like a copy of R2 that's floating out there in space somewhere. And the normal vector is this direction which is perpendicular to any vector parallel to your plane. Um, so this is kind of the idea for, for planes. The funny thing about planes, planes are the simplest surfaces that we can draw in three dimensions, right? They're flat surfaces, they're quite simple. Despite being simple, they're, they're somehow really hard to draw. Um, planes are tricky, they're tricky to draw. Um, the other surfaces we're gonna look at somehow seem a little bit easier to deal with, but planes, getting planes to look right is, it's, it's harder than you might think. Especially when you start wanting to draw, like, say, two or more planes and have them intersect. Um, it's hard to get it right. Uh, fortunately, um, this is in the fine arts class. You're not going to be graded on your ability to draw these things. So it's okay. All right. 
Um, now, uh, so we think of lines and planes as kind of the simplest things, planes as being the simplest surfaces, these sort of linear objects. Um, well, then you can go into a, what are called cylinders. You say, what, what, what is a cylinder? So a cylinder, I mean, we, we have our sort of prototype example for a cylinder, right? So the example that we think of when we think cylinder is, you know, like an actual honest to goodness cylinder. You think about saying, okay, x squared plus y squared is equal to one, something like that, right? Um, so if we were just in the xy plane, we have a circle, right? Um, but the cylinder is what you get if you kind of take that circle and extend it, right? Because um, if this equation here says nothing about z, right? It says nothing about z. And that means z can take on any value. So for every point on the circle, right, that's the corresponding to z equal to zero. But you can change the z coordinate, right, and you actually get the entire line moving in the z direction through that point. And every point on that line would still satisfy the equation, right, because this would be a point x, y, z, where it's still true that x squared plus y squared is equal to one. And so, of course, what you get is you get this, you know, sort of object that is more or less what we usually think of when we hear the word cylinder. But we try to extend that idea to, to other sorts of, of curves, right? So if we think about like y is equal to x squared, x, y. Um, so y equals x squared is a parabola and something like that, right? If we're drawing that in the xy plane. And then we do the same kind of thing. We say, okay, well, we can actually, you know, extend this kind of up, go up, and we get this sort of object that looks something like this, right? So we get this uh, kind of like folded sheet now, right? So a sheet that's kind of folded into a parabola. Um, same thing for example, like z equals e to the y. Uh, I don't know if I can sketch all of these, but so for z equals e to the y, if I'm in the oops, if I'm in the y z plane, well I can I can draw that exponential like so, right? But then I, I want to kind of have this sort of cylinder thing going on, so I want to think about well. You know, there's going to be more copies of it as I kind of slide back and forth along, you know, parallel to the to the x-axis. So we get something that looks like that. Okay, not so successful on drawing that one. It's okay. The aren't these aren't all going to be wins. Uh, the last one is kind of interesting. I mean, um, get a computer to plot that one for you and, and see what happens. Um, the interesting thing with that is is now you have all three variables in there, and so it doesn't seem quite the same. Uh, but if you look along lines where x and y are constant, you, know, you would still get sort of that, that sort of cross-section approach. Um, so you get something that looks like kind of a, well, let me, I'm not going to be able to draw it very well. But along kind of lines, x plus y is equal to a constant along these lines you get kind of waves, so sine waves that kind of go up, coming out. You should get something that looks something like that, right? So it's like you take a sine curve and then you sort of stretch it out so you actually see these waves going along. Um, a lot of these are going to be not very good graphs when you try to do them by hand. Better to ask the computer. Um, I'll throw some links up on, on Moodle for places where you can go to get these plotted. Um, GeoGebra is one option. There is a 3D plotter for it. Um, there's another one. Um, here's a, so here's, here's a uh, plotting resource. It's pretty good. It's called a Calc Plot 3D. Um, so if you're ever if you're ever working with these things 
and you just have no idea like what the hell it's supposed to look like. Um, you go to one of these um, online plotting resources like CalcPlot 3D, you put it in, uh, and you plot it. Um, Wolfram Alpha will do it too, um, but unless you're on the paid version of Wolfram Alpha, it's not going to let you interact with the plot. It's going to give you a static plot. Um, CalcPlot 3D will let you click and drag so you can rotate and look at it from different angles. Um, by the way, also the web version of the textbook, most of the, all those 3D figures in the textbook are also interactive. You can drag to rotate, you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, the textbook figures are pretty good. They're all the textbook figures are all rendered in WebGL, um, and they're they're interactive. They look really nice. Um, so certainly um, play around with the textbook as much as you can. Okay. Um, next up after cylinders are the so-called quadric surfaces. Uh, we tend to, when we're doing problems with calculus and several variables, we tend to do a lot of stuff with just quadric surfaces because um, we know what they look like and they give us kind of some simple examples to fall back on. So we can say, okay, I, I can draw this I, and I can draw it mostly just because I know what it looks like. I've seen it in the past. Um, and, then, and then you have some visuals. You really, as you go up to kind of functions of two and three variables, it's, it really helps to have the visuals. It's hard to do these things if you can't um, picture what's going on. Um, so what do we get in, in something like this? Well, actually, this one we can understand what this is because this is just the distance. Uh, well, it's distance squared, right? Between two points, between x, y, z, and a, b, c. Um, and we're saying that distance is a constant. Yeah, we know what this is, right? This is a sphere, right? Just like in the plane, all the points that are a constant distance from a center gives you a circle. In R3, you're gonna get a sphere, right? So we're gonna have a point A, B, C, okay? And we're gonna get something like this. We'll draw a circle around there, right? And maybe we say, okay, yeah, that's radius R. And now that still kind of doesn't look very spherish, it looks like a circle. So what we tend to do is we just add an equator. Just go around. Oop. Oh my goodness. Very sorry. I hit some zoom button. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, and now you you can sort of visualize that sphere, right? Um, if you if you want to add like a line of uh, of longitude or something to really make it look more spherish, you can do that. Kind of go this way and around the back. Um, you know, doesn't have to be fancy, right? Just just a few basic strokes to give you an idea of the shape that you're looking at. Once it looks like a sphere to you, you're good to go. Okay. All right. So, spheres. What can we do? Can we generalize spheres? Um, we can. Ah, yeah, sorry. I've got some more for you, but this is sort of a warm-up. I forgot. I thought this slide was later. All right. Um, so one of the things you can do if somebody hands you an equation, like say somebody gives you x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, okay? And you're not sure what that thing's supposed to look like. I know what it looks like. It's a sphere. Okay, but suppose you don't know. Um, so what you can do is you can say, well, what is the, what is the z equals 0 trace? Well, the z equals 0 is just x squared plus y squared equals 4. Well, that's a circle in the xy plane, right? Here's, that's going to be the point 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 0, right? Um, I can similarly say, well, what about if I put, um, so what if I put, say, y is equal to 0. And I get x squared plus z squared is equal to 4. Well, that's a circle in the xz plane, right? So now I get kind of this circle coming down like so, the xz plane, right? Or, or I could put uh, x equal to 0, and I get y squared 
plus z squared is equal to 4. And I say, okay, well, that's a circle in the, in the yz plane. Okay. So often you, you basically slice your surface with a plane, right? Um, and the easiest ones to slice with are the coordinate planes. And if you need a few more to kind of really nail it down, uh, you might say, well, what if I did like uh, z is, is 2, right? And then you would have x squared plus y squared. Um, well, not z equals 2. Maybe z is 1. So 1 is equal to 4, right? So x squared plus y squared is equal to 3. So that means you know, if I'm here, I'm like halfway between 0 and 2 on the z-axis, I get, well, it's another circle, but this time it's a circle of radius root 3, right? And actually, I could, the same would be true at minus 1. I would get the same sort of thing down at minus 1, right? I would get kind of that. There, right? So you get different lines of latitude for different z values. Um, so typically, once you do a few of those traces, and the traces that you want to do are the ones where you set one of the variables equal to a constant, because those are si simplest. Um, you basically just draw the, the corresponding curve in that plane, right? So in the plane z equals 1, I draw a circle of radius root 3. In the plane z equals 0, I draw a circle of radius 2, and so on. Um, you get a few curves and then you let your brain kind of fill in the gaps. That's the strategy. Okay. So, ellipsoids. Uh, what does an ellipsoid look like? So an ellipsoid, this kind of, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do all these with sort of the center at the origin, just for simplicity. You can always shift these things, just like you do in two, two dimensions, you can shift, right? Um, an ellipsoid looks something like this x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared plus z squared over c squared equals 1. Okay, It's a variation on the theme of a sphere. Okay, So what do we get if we try to draw an ellipsoid? Well, if I put, say, again, we can think about doing traces, right? So the z equals 0 trace. What is the z equals 0 trace? Well, if I put z equal to 0, um, then this is gone, and I just have an equation for an ellipse, right? x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. Um, and we talked about how to plot ellipses back in the conic sections, right, the previous chapter. And we said, okay, yeah, we know what that looks like, right? We go, um, here is a zero zero over here maybe is uh, zero b zero and we get we get this ellipse something like that right um, and then similarly if we did say uh, x is equal to zero we're gonna go zero zero c and there, and we try to go through, through there, in the yz plane, and we get something that looks like that. And, and then we try the y equals zero trace, and we get something that looks like uh, this. Okay, and now this, obviously, is a disaster, right? You were like, okay, what? What did, what did I even draw? Um, so we say, no, this uh, this is not so good. So how do you how do you actually draw an ellipsoid and make it look reasonable? Um, what you do is you tend to do this. You draw draw an ellipse in the yz plane and then kind of join it around like that and then like that okay so that's what it should look like uh, it's uh, 
it's hard to do it if you don't draw the the YZ one first, right? Um, so do the do the x equals zero trace first. That's going to be the easiest one to do. Um, otherwise, you you end up with like a disaster like I have over here, right? So you can always try it again, but it yeah, it's always a mess. It's always a mess. So you do okay. this one. Right, that's the x equals zero trace. Um, the z equals zero trace would be this one here. And then the y equals zero trace is this one kind of coming in through there. Um, ultimately, you just try to draw something that is vaguely football shaped and you have an ellipsoid, okay? All right. Um, next up are the elliptic paraboloids. So an elliptic paraboloid, it looks something like this. Z over C is X squared over A squared plus Y squared over B squared. Okay. Uh, now in this case, if C is positive, then z has to always be bigger than or equal to zero, right? Because x squared plus y squared can't be can't be negative. Um, and so what you get is, if you think about putting, say, if you think about what happens when x is equal to zero, well, when x is equal to zero, you get a parabola in the y z plane, right? And if y is equal to zero, you get a parabola. In the x set plane, and if uh, well, we don't want z equals zero. Z equals zero just gives us the the origin. Um, if we take z equal to some uh, some constant value, well, then what we get is we get an ellipse. We get something that kind of comes around like so. Okay. So, so elliptic paraboloids are this kind of cup shapes, right? So typically you get something, the way you'd probably draw this is you just draw, draw an ellipse and you draw a parabola and you have an elliptic paraboloid, okay? Once you get a bit of practice, you can draw those ones fairly easily. They're not so bad, okay? How are we doing on time? About 10 minutes. I think we're doing all right. Still not seeing any, any questions. Um, and of course, you can uh, you can also change things up here. We could also do things like we could do uh, y is say x squared over a squared plus z squared over b squared, and have something which opens out along the y-axis. We can have it that way as well. And of course, they could also open along the x-axis. And if you change C to a negative value, it's going to open down instead of up and so on. Um, so elliptic paraboloids always have these kind of cup shapes, right? Um, it's, uh, it's essentially the shape of like a satellite dish. Okay? All right. So moving along. Hyperbolic paraboloids. So hyperbolic paraboloids are hard to draw. So here, here's kind of a, a typical hyperbolic paraboloid would look like this. Um, Z over C is like X squared over A squared minus Y squared over B squared. And again, we can, we can kind of swap up the roles of X and Y here. Um, but what you get is you get something where um, if you put, say, X equal to zero, and this is why I... I if you try to draw these traces, it always looks bad, right? Um, the x equals zero trace, uh, and let's assume for now that c is positive. Um, the x equals zero trace is going to be a parabola that, that opens down, like this, okay? Um, the y equals zero trace, on the other hand, 
is a parabola in the xz plane that opens up. Okay? And so what you have to kind of think of is, is as you go along, kind of at every point of that upward opening parabola, um, there's a downward opening one. Okay? And, and similarly, on each downward opening parabola, there's an upward opening one. And, and, and you try to kind of put these together. And, and then the other thing is, if you're looking at it from above, there should be like a hyper, you know, um, if I put z equal to some, uh, to some constant, well, I should, get, I should get some sort of hyperbola. Uh, so, like, how do you actually draw these? Well, the key is understanding that this is a so-called uh, saddle surface. So what it looks like is something like this. It's kind of like that. Goes down like that. Something like this. And it's still, it's still going to look terrible, right? Um, so you try to draw, you do your best kind of attempt at drawing something that looks like a saddle, right? I told you it was going to be terrible. Um, ask the computer to draw a few hyperbolic paraboloids for you. It's going to be better than my manual sketch. Um, don't worry, there's not going to be an exam question where I ask you to draw a hyperbolic paraboloid and grade you on the quality of your sketch. 